Now we dive into a bit more technical topic, and I'm, I'm very excited um, to uh, see so many faces on, on this very important topic whenever, whenever it comes to handling security incidents, we should understand what is actually happening on the machine. And you guess what? What is happening on the machine is visible in memory. So we need to understand memory. And we have an expert here today, Eddie Brenkers from BLS, who's going to give us an insight um, on memory forensics and also what every incident responder should know about this field. So I'm very happy to welcome on stage Eddie Blenkers. Please welcome and join. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, Swiss Cyberstorm. Um, that's my first time I'm attending this conference. And um, well, I heard we have like a few management related participants in the uh, audience and more engineer or hardcore technical deep dive fans. So who of you would consider himself more on the technical side of IT security? That's the majority because, well, welcome to this party because um, then this talk is for you. Um, before we dive into it, I work for BLS. BLS is uh, the second largest tra train company. Uh, the big plus is uh, we serve some of the most beautiful destinations here in, in the country. And it's also a very cool place to work. Um, me, I'm uh, doing IT for well, way too long. In other words, um, I'm just an old guy who uh, actually likes to look at hex code. And um, using memo for memory forensics, we do that a lot. Uh, memory forensics is um, a method to analyze a computer's RAM. So I don't have to explain you what RAM is. Uh, and my goal is to find um, uh, indicators of an attack. Like usually if you look at uh, some, some rootkit or any other type of backdoor, there must be encoded deep inside uh, an IP address or URL that is used by the bad guys to communicate with the infected system. And um, that information is usually encrypted and it takes, using reverse engineering, some time to decrypt that. Now, personally, I'm not a reverse engineer, but I know that in most cases, I will find that information in plain text in the memory. It's like that malware can run or, or can hide but it has to run. And I just have to find out where exactly in the memory that piece of bad software is running. Do I have to point this somewhere? Here we go. So before we can actually analyze um, uh, a dump file, we have to obtain it. So the dump file is not something that you find or where you press a button or run this little tool that comes from Microsoft, but you have to use special techniques. Personally, I only know a little bit about Windows. I know nothing about Linux, so I can only present a, a Windows case here. So my favorite techniques are either I have a, a virtual system and then I go to the administrator, ask him for a snapshot of the machine. And that snapshot includes also the, ra the RAM with all the memory used by the kernel and the running processes. Another tool which I could run if it's not a physical system uh, or if it's not a virtual system, I could use RAM capture from a company called Belkasoft, which is, as far as I know, a free tool at this time. Very useful. And that generates for you a dump file, which is as big usually as the computer has memory, which also means you should store that locally on disk. Now, that is the first thing we should, should keep in mind. If you store the RAM or the, uh, the dump file on a network drive, chances are that you pollute all the computer's memory with the I.O. operations of the, the dump file being written to the remote share. And you want to avoid that, so it's preferable to use, say, a thumb drive or something connected to that computer, your local storage medium. Once we have a dump file, I use volatility to analyze it. Volatility is a Python-based application. Um, you can download it. They have the Volatility Foundation that maintains the software. And we're currently seeing a transition from version 2 to version 3, which seems to happen over a number of years. Um, version 3 has a number of advantages. Basically, you're more fluid. The, th uh, the workflow is a bit faster. But not all functions from version 2 are available yet in version 3. 
Most importantly, I hope none of you still has Windows XP systems or older. I'm not asking that because it would be embarrassing to raise the hand, but um, we all know, I see a few people, folks grinning there, so I know, um, well, it is hard to change all things as fast as we would like to in the security world. And these legacy, legacy systems, Windows XP and older, are not supported by Volatility version 3. So the dump file holds many gigabytes of information, and at first view, they look very unorganized and very unstructured. Um, so that Volatility can interpret the data, we have to tell it what operating system it is running. And to do that, we use uh, the command image info. So you can see here, I use vol.pi, so in these uh, examples, I'm mostly using version two syntax. Um, and I give it my dump file with minus F, uh, which is like dumpfile.mem. And I tell it, well, analyze that dump file and see if you can investigate or find out which operating system is in use. And you would get something like Windows 7, Windows 8, a service pack maybe, uh, or it could be a server work, uh, operating system. And I couldn't fit all the possible options here onto the slide. So in this case, we find, or just know it by asking the administrator, that is Windows 10 with a certain build number that relates to, well, whatever, 1809 or whatever, or 2009, whatever um, Windows version you are currently running. So during an investigation, I look out for processes that are currently running. Um, there could be some hidden processes that you cannot find with the usual task manager or whatever your tool of choice is. Um, I could I will also, I'm very much interested in the drivers that are loaded by the operating system to see if they all belong onto the system or if there is something odd that I feel like, well, why exactly do we have like a virtual box driver here with virtual box not being installed? That would be like something to look out for. We see active network connections. Um, we th see the command lines for all running processes. Uh, we see code that has been injected by the malware when attackers try to hide themselves inside a legitimate process. We will get to that in a minute. Now, if we talk about memory forensics, we have to have a certain understanding of the address space in the computer. So usually we have physical addresses, which is if you take like a multimeter and if you would be able to read the voltage on the address pins millions of times per second, then you would see like, oh, here is a physical address that is used on the bus. Within the computer itself, we always find virtual addresses. And these virtual addresses are well, not always unique. So you see here that we have an upper half of the memory, um, which is always used by the Windows kernel itself. And that is where we find drivers or metadata about the processes, like which security uh, authorizations do you have, uh, which files have been opened, uh, and, and other information, which network in uh, connections uh, do we have on the system. And in the lower half, we find all the application processes, and each process has its own memory space. Um, there is an instruction on the CPU that goes like, well, switch from one process to another. I'm so far using my Outlook to write some email, and then I find out, oh, well, let's um, read something up on the internet. That is when a task switch happens, and um, the internet browser is using a completely different set of memory pages, but they might share the same addresses. And the kernel makes sure that, as you see here in these blue sections uh, of the screen, the kernel makes sure that these processes are disjunct, so that they have no common information, and they can only exchange information through um, dedicated and documented APIs. Within a single process, you might find at least one, sometimes or often more, uh, multiple uh, threats. And now, if you want to go home and take something home and impress your boss, like, you know, what did you learn on, on CyberStorm? You go like, well, did you ever know what a threat is? And then you go like, a threat is a unit of work for the scheduler. Take that home. Bom. 
So, if anybody goes like, oh, wow, wow you, you're really a smart guy, you know what a threat is. Now, actually, if you look at a web page that has a lot of animations, like all these animated GIFs and smileys and whatever you find, chances are that each of these um, animated pictures is handled by one thread. So it is not uncommon to find like a hundred different threads inside of one browser, depending on what web page you're visiting. Um, I take two steps to investigate the computer. One part is the Windows kernel. We have seen that is that big gray block that we've seen towering over the whole memory. And the other part is all the individual processes uh, activated by the users. We call that the user land. So when we talk about a Windows kernel, um, first of all, malware in the Windows kernel um, was very prevalent in times of Windows XP and even up to Windows 7. And then Microsoft had added something called the kernel patch guard, which um, made it very difficult for attackers to manipulate data structures. A typical manipulation would be, I want to hide all files belonging to my rootkit. And the operating system has central control. Everybody, every process, the Windows Explorer or your command line where you type in a directory command, everybody goes to the kernel and goes like, give me a list of all files in my user's directory. And a rootkit would modify the answers that go, are returned so that your files or, or the rootkit files are invisible to the user. Now, we call that a hook when that information is being filtered. And these hooks will be detected by Windows itself, by the Windows kernel patch guard, and that makes it very hard for the attacker to um, manipulate these data structures. And then something nice happened. In 2019, uh, a gentleman called Luke Reginato has um, uh, used um, a just-in-time debugger to investigate kernel, kernel patch guard. And he held a very, very remarkable talk on offensive con uh, in Berlin about that. And he had explained in great detail how patch guard works. And a few months later, we found on, um, on GitHub some source code of how to disable Windows kernel patch guard. And now all these games are back into play again. So um, these drivers currently to install, so to manipulate these data structures, you need a driver. And the uh, actors actually invent their own drivers. They write their own drivers. They create companies who provide some low-level driver for, I don't know, your, your blinking Christmas tree or whatever. And they hide their code inside their driver. So the only reason why they, they create a, uh, a company is because they need a trustworthy certificate from Microsoft that allows them to, drive, to load their code into the kernel. Um, actually, these bad drivers became so popular that Microsoft has introduced something called an attack surface reduction rule. Uh, that is a function that can be activated within Windows itself to block known malicious drivers. And one of them would be what I've mentioned earlier, the um, uh, rather old VirtualBox uh, network driver. So once an attacker has hooked all the drivers and is able to hide himself, You're, you as a first responder or as a system administrator have no chance to identify the attacker with the out-of-the-box tools offered by Microsoft or by any other onboard mechanism that relies only on the kernel routine. So usually you will find that file names have been hidden, registry entries, processes, network connections. So all that has been hidden in the past by rootkits and all that is back into play with well, the current state of the art. Still, rootkit or, or kernel malware is pretty rare. Um, most infections that I've seen over the last few years still rely on, um, uh, on, on user land hooking. So there are a few data structures that can be uh, uh, that can be hooked, like hidden drivers, so they won't show up in whatever tool you use to, to query uh, the number of loaded drivers. Uh, or another interesting part would be: Do we have code that does not belong to a driver? Remember, usually you load your sys file, your driver, into memory, and then that code gets executed. And if an attacker decides like, oh, I don't want that my sys file is visible in memory, he might copy his own 
uh, code somewhere into a block of non-paged pool and create a worker thread in there and like trigger a timer every couple of seconds. And that would be a dry code hanging somewhere and we can find that rather quickly using volatility. So here's one type of a hook. So you see um, we have uh, we, we're starting volatility and we give it m the file name again, minus F is the file name, and then we have to tell volatility which profile we are using. So we had earlier used the command image info to determine the exact version of the operating system. And then we tell it, look at the system service descriptor table or SSDT for short. And you will notice that down there, what usually you will find here win32k.sys as uh, f functions that, that service these uh, uh, system services or the anti-kernel. And if you find something sticking out, like here in this case, antivirus.sys, I immediately want to know, well, what the hell is this antivirus.sys driver? Um, usually an antivirus system in these days is using a completely different API. So uh, under Windows XP, we used to hook certain functions um, uh, by for an antivirus system, but nowadays that sticks out like a sore thumb, right away investigate that driver and find out if it's any good or if that is purposefully was installed by your administrators and why. Another function would be to check the list of known modules or maybe if there are some hidden modules in the kernel itself. And we have two plugins, like we've seen the SSDT, we would replace the command with either mod list or with mod scan. Sorry for the uppercase M in the top, so that's all always lowercase what you use in, um, in volatility. And then you get a list that looks a bit like this. Actually, the output is a lot wider, and I've cut out a few columns to make this more readable. But the important part is you have a list of all drivers known to the operating system. And when we use mod scan, we list, we find maybe extra drivers which do not appear in the official list. And that is someone who snuck in somewhere, somehow into the operating system. So here's what I do in my investigation. Um, I run modules first, pipe that out into a trace file, uh, in, into a text file, and then I run mod scan and drag that into a trace file. I just noticed um, that it annoys me because I, I messed up the, the commands. It should be mod scan, the second one. And then I use a little grab command to compare the output from these two, uh, from these two commands. And then I notice, oh, hold on, mod scan actually delivers me two or three extra lines. And there might be something that was mistakenly identified by volatility as a driver, but it's not really. But if I find an extra line, I go like, oh boy, yeah, you will have one of these base addresses like we've seen here, that looks valid, and I might even have a file name that looks valid, then it's worth to chase after that memory block, extract the data from there, and send it away to my antivirus. So that's one short look into the, into the kernel. The other part of investigation would be the user land. And we can find, again, hidden processes or processes that have been terminated. We might find command lines that give away a lot of interesting information. And again, a ton of hooks where the output gets filtered by some type of evil code so that the true rootkit of the malware is not visible to the end user. And one function which I'm using here is the plugin called uh, PS3, which shows us a list of running processes in a tree-like form, and we recognize which process has been created by what parent process. So that relationship about, about a parent process and, and its child process can be a good insight into something malicious. Um, there is one common thing here called SVC host. So I mean, you all mentioned, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a technical guy, but who of you thinks that, well, I know exactly what SVC host stands for and how it is, how is it used. I have a very precise feature idea of, of how that all works. Well, it's very, pretty daring. Uh, let me put the question otherwise. Um, do you think you have at least one administrator who would skip over any instance of SVC host because I might have 80 processes called SVC host, so it must be something normal? Who of you thinks like I've at least one guy in my company who skips over all the SVC hosts? Uh, just a few hands going up. That's surprised. So all your administrators say, oh no, what SVC host is good for. Sorry, I, I can't give you any news here. Oh, too bad. Actually, what happens is SVC host stands for service host. 
And that is like any service that you have, like your DNS client or your DHCP client, all these are somewhere hosted by that executable. And because they are so all over the place, it's a great name that camouflages sort of into the process list. But in reality, SVC host should only be started by services.exe, which is like the big controller taking care of every other SVC host process. Now, if you have like a service host started by virtual windows, that's bad news because that means there's a malicious document active within WinWord that has created somehow a service host and is using that as a host for malware and not for a legitimate service. So in that situation, I would immediately like extract all the memory from the service host and see what's going in there. On, in there. So the next step would be to dump the whole memory from the rogue service host, um, see if there are certain executable pages. So every memory page in Windows has access rights, pretty much like you have access rights on the file system. You have read, write, and execute. So it's just these three bits. You can read, write, and execute. There's not a big ACL behind each memory page. But if I find memory that has the bits like I can read it, I can write it, and I can execute it, that is often, but not always, it's often an indicator for something malicious sitting in that memory block. And that is worth to extract and see if I find something interesting in there. Remember what I said in the beginning? Malware can hide, but it has to run. So um, I would run the strings command, and more often than not, I will find within these strings the domain names for a command and control server that is contacted by that specific piece of malware. So it's just a matter of dump the memory of that suspicious process, run strings against it, and you will find a lot of usual strings, like for example, well, Microsoft. Well, yes, you find a ton of Microsoft DLLs and Microsoft um, uh, certificates and, and Microsoft um, URLs in every single legitimate DLL because it goes, like, yes, I've been signed by Microsoft and uh, uh, it is uh, signed by a trustworthy component from Microsoft. Well, that's normal. So Microsoft is not your CNC server. I promise you that. But um, it's the one line that somehow sticks out and where you think like, why the hell do I have a connection to a university somewhere in Southern America. And that would be like, unless you are in the business of uh, well, dealing with universities in Southern America, that would be like a dead giveaway. A few other things to find is like open files, which tells me which files is the malware accessing. Is there a file that holds configuration information? Do I have network connections, interesting registry keys that are worth following up? Like when have they been changed? When have they been added? And even better, file system metadata. On every Windows machine, you will find a file called a master file table, MFT, which is invisible. So Microsoft is doing its very best to hide the existence from a file called $MFT from you. But that holds a reference of all the files on your hard disk. And this master file table is always resident in memory with information about where is the file on the disk, when has it been created, when has it been accessed, and when has it been changed. Well, access timestamps may or may not be maintained depending on your configuration. But using the timestamps, both from the master file table and from the registry and from all the running processes, um, we can often create a timeline that shows us when was the system infected, when was the configuration changed, or where did I find temporary data that was created for exfiltration. So all that can be found by a thorough analysis of a memory dump. The most important part for me as an incident responder is I want to find that injected code. And in that injected found code, I want to find the command and control service. And the important part is in my proxy log files, um, I will see the one system that is currently used for communication, but not all of them. There might be a secondary backup system that is being used. Um, another part, of course, since things are encrypted, we often enough find uh, encrypted stuff as well. There is one slight obstacle that came up with Windows 8, and that is called memory compression. And um, the, lucky enough, we can decompress whatever memory page we have uh, using uh, predefined functions, and we have to run that currently outside of volatility. And then we got all the strings that we are interested in. And now I'm being signaled here that uh, it's time actually to come to an end, which tells us, well, 
we might have time for how many questions? One or two? Thank you, Eddie. Very good, uh, very interesting presentation. 